Wonderful. Even though we still need to stay socially distant, Westwood remains a bustling community with lots and lots going on. I invite you to visit westwoodunitarian.ca to view our online social calendar and discover more ways to connect. Our first hymn this morning is Gathered Here Together, played by Westwood's very own Steve Bell. As we come together this morning, I pause to acknowledge and affirm that the land where we gather has borne witness to thousands of years of Indigenous history, culture, and spirituality, and continues to do so, providing a rich and fertile context as we gather together this morning. Westwood's home, as well as mine, is located in Ameskechi, Waskahagan meaning Beaver Hills House, the Cree name for Edmonton. As Unitarian Universalists, our first principle is the inherent worth and dignity of every person, which I believe to be a keystone in reconciliation. I acknowledge my role as a treaty person and feel called to explore what that means and how to be a responsible and respectful ally. I welcome you to share in the chat or in the comments section on YouTube the name of the traditional lands of which you are tuning in from this morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Westwood Unitarian Online. My name is Heather McLean Smith, and my pronouns are she and her. It is my honor to be your service leader this morning. At Westwood Unitarian, and collectively as Unitarian Universalists, we are all on our own individual search for truth and meaning. There is more than one way of thinking here, and that 
is and that and that there is more than one way of being and because of all of this makes us rich beyond measure i want to extend a special thank you to brenda jackson uh, you connected us with our guest speaker this morning and i'm really really looking forward to hearing what she has to say i also want to thank our tech wizards alara stefan gadet and bill lee as well as steve bell for sharing his music and Catherine for joining us, along with all of her friends tuning in from Kelowna, BC, and maybe even Australia. On behalf of the congregation, I also want to bid a special welcome to our online community. We all yearn to be together again, and we are especially looking forward to meeting you. I am wishing more and more friends a happy jabby day on social media, which gives me hope that we will be together again one day in the future, hopefully soon. Our child's lighting comes from the words of Wendell Berry. I'm going to read the chalice lighting and then I'm going to light the chalice. I invite you to light the chalice along with me after the chalice lighting. It's titled The Real Work. It may be that when we no longer know what to do, we have come to our real work. And that when we no longer know what, which way to go, we have come to our real journey. The mind that is no longer baffled is, no, is not employed. An impeded stream is the one that sings. The lighting of candles of concern and celebration is a cherished tradition at Westwood, along with many other Unitarian Universalist congregations. I invite you to type your messages of joys, sorrows, connection, love, and support to and from each other into the chat as we listen to a beautiful composition of Chickadee played by Steve Bell.
What beautiful music. Thank you for sharing everyone. I light this final candle for all the joys and sorrows that remain in our hearts, spoken or unspoken. Please join me in the affirmation. May the light of these candles inspire us to use our power to heal and not to harm, to help and not to hinder, to serve the spirit of life in loving affection and trusting hope. Westwood is a self-sustained, self-sufficient community sustained and maintained by its membership. There are many ways to donate to Westwood, including by volunteering your time, sharing your talent, or contributing financially. E-transfers can be made out to info at westwoodunitarian.ca. Now, let's sing along with Rebecca Patterson. From you I receive, to you I give. Red lines appear in our path whenever we dare to try something new. Sometimes a story is the best way to deal with them. Storyteller and photographer Catherine Wellner uses a well-known folktale to show how she and others keep their creative spirits from turning and running. With such a blended background, Catherine understands how people how to help people through challenges with a good story. Take it away, Catherine. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Steve, what beautiful music. I'm just going to go to, to uh, share screen here and I'm going to start my talk. What am I doing? There we go. Okay, and hit play. And we shall begin. <laughs> this, is, this is all new territory for most of us, this Zoom thing, but here we are. So I wanna thank all of you Westwood Unitarians for inviting me to join you. You're on Treaty 6 territory and we here in the Okanagan are on the unceded territory of the Selig people. Now on on December 20th, 2020, Brenda Jackson wrote these magical words to me. I was hoping you might share your storytelling, your writing, creativity, storytelling, and photography with us one morning. That was like being asked to share the contents of my heart. So I was excited and I said, yes. And then as soon as the date and the month's theme of, of uh, momentum were confirmed, my red lion sprang into action. Nattering, roaring, they yammered their crazy talk. What do you know about momentum? You've repeatedly been stopped in your tracks. Besides, what would you have worth sharing with such a special group of people? You're sure to disappoint them. So as I always do when asked to give a presentation on anything, I begin cruising the internet, reading frantically, amassing tons of information I would never use, and generally stirring the waters of my mind into a frothy mess. It's not progressing. <laughs> Stuck in slide hell here. Come on. Okay. I'll just have to click differently. And then I remembered the red line, a Persian tale that was published decades ago by New York Story. The New York storyteller Diane Wolfstein. 
It has brought me safely home more times than I can count. And I'll share a brief version of it. The story tells of Osgid, a young Persian prince. When the king died, his father, Osgid had to undergo a traditional test. He must show his courage by facing the red lion. As anyone would be, he was terrified. So in the dead of night, he mounted his horse and rode away from the kingdom. He rode all night and into the next day. And entering a forest, he heard sweet music. He found it, the source of it, in a clearing. A shepherd was playing his sitar as sheep grazed around him. The shepherd invited him to stay, and as he thought, oh, this is why I left the kingdom, to find peace. They talked all day, and when shadows lengthened, the shepherd said urgently, we must return to the village. No, let's stay here, said Asgid. It's so peaceful. The shepherd pulled up his sleeve and showed angry scars. The red lion stalks these woods at night. I stayed out too late once. Reluctantly, Asgid mounted his horse. I must leave you. I thank you for your kindness. Asgid rode through the next night and into the next day until he came upon a desert encampment. The sheik invited him to dine. He watched his young visitor carefully. At dark, he said, you are welcome to join us here. And the desert people were impressed with Asgid. They wanted him to stay. They offered him a fine horse that was a desert horse and said, ride with us. And Asgid thought, well, that's why I left my home, to become part of these honorable and generous people. But the sheik added, before you can become one of us, you must prove your courage by facing the red lion. That night, a saddened Asgid quietly mounted his own horse and rode through the night. The next day, he came to the walls of a city and he went to the gate where he asked the guards to take him to the emir. The emir was impressed with the quiet, strong demeanor of his unexpected guest and invited him to dine with him and his daughter and said, my daughter first will show you the palace gardens. As he watched the beautiful one, young woman, as he thought, this is why I left my kingdom. Perhaps one day the emir will allow us to marry. After dinner, the emir and Asgid talked for hours in the library. And finally, the emir, emir yawned and said, I'll show you to your room. It's at the top of the stairs. As the emir opened the library door, Asgid heard a lion roar. Uh, what's that? That's our guard lion, said the emir. It won't hurt you. I, I'm not tired, said Asgid. Um, I, I will stay in the library for a while. Asgid closed the library door, and before long, he heard the lion pacing outside, roaring softly. Asgid listened and heard the message of the lion. If you do not go home and face your own red lions, you will find red lions everywhere. So just before dawn, Asgid began the long ride back to his kingdom, ready to face his red lion. On the day of his challenge, the stands filled with visitors from around the kingdom. The shepherd was there. So was the desert sheik. So too were the emir and his daughter. Asgid entered the ring, weapon in hand and waited. The gate opened and the red lion bounded toward him. Asgid stood afraid, but determined. The lion leaped over his head. Asgid swirled to face him and saw the red lion rolling in the sand, enjoying a good scratch. The lion was tame. The red lions had always been tame. Only fear made them dangerous. Asgid was crowned king, 
In time, he married the emir's daughter. Together, they ruled the kingdom wisely and well. And storytelling has always been at the heart of my work as a school librarian, as a traveling professional storyteller, as a community development consultant, and more recently as a writer and photographer. Along the way, I learned from some brave lion tamers, and I want you to meet some of them. Eight-year-old Robbie Curry applied to be part of the Long Ridge Storytellers. I was a school librarian in Rochester, New York, and I was telling stories to 24 classes a week. And I thought, wouldn't it be fun for the children to experience some of the pleasure I felt watching them absorbed in a story? Now, our students were only grades K through three. I thought the third graders might be old enough to be part of a storytelling troupe. So I talked it up with the third grade classes and with my parent volunteers. I created an application form and waited. Robbie Curry was one of the first to apply. He was one of those good, quiet children who would disappear in the controlled chaos of a large class. I could not fathom his wanting to be a storyteller, but oh dear, his mother was one of my best volunteers. She told me, I asked him why he wanted to do it because he's so shy. And he said to me, so this was his Robbie's mother. He said, Mom, I think it's time I stopped being so shy. Well, he learned his story and everyone else's. He gave every young performer total attention. When they lost the thread of their stories, he would mouth the words to them. When we took the children to other schools, to a mall, to perform on public radio, Robbie was their finest cheerleader, looking at every one of them as that they were the best storyteller on the face of the planet. Robbie's red lion was fear of standing out and standing up. He turned it into a pet. I was telling stories regularly at the box, Boxcart Bookshop and the Rochester Storytelling Guild held a farewell party for me when I moved to Seattle, Washington. Now naturally, I wanted to be remembered for my superb last story. So I learned a new one. <laughs> It was Maria Polushkin's tale, The Little Hen and the Red Giant. The hen is tired of the farmer stealing their eggs to appease the giant. He's a bully who loves eggs. So she hops off her nest and she marches off to stop him. Naturally, she undergoes some trials, some tests, and then she has to goad the ogre into running after her. And then she exhausts him two days in a row and then the the third day, she leads him to a deep body of water. He's running so fast he can't stop and drowns. She walks home to lay some eggs. Now, the story is charming. My telling was not. It fell as flat as a pancake. My last story in Rochester. I tugged my ragged storytelling tail between my legs and went off to Seattle. Four years later, I was telling stories and giving workshops for audiences of all ages and had been tapped to serve on the board of a National Storytelling Association. So the chance to participate in a storytelling conference in the city where my storytelling career had started was too good to pass up. That's when I learned the impact of my pancake flat story. Paula Ziegelstein had been in the audience for the Little Hen story, which I had never told again. She saw me at the conference and made a beeline to thank me for a story that had changed her life. I was shocked when she said it was the little hen and the giant. She promised to bring proof the next day. <coughs> when she had heard the story, she heard her red lion's roar. She was letting the giants in her life steal her eggs. She kept that story in her heart and decided to celebrate her skills, her body, and her worth. So for her 40th birthday, she commissioned a small sculpture of a voluptuous woman dressed in a low cut evening gown with the head of a chicken. Now, years later, I was living on a small ranch in central British Columbia, way away from pain markets and had animals to feed. I couldn't go traveling for gigs. So I turned my storytelling skills into a new career as a community development consultant. Now, after a long stretch of wrestling with the red lion of imposter syndrome, I realized that community development was about storytelling. Some 
community organization and I was bogged down in the story that wasn't working for them anymore. They needed some outsider to come and help them to uncover the new story that would guide them onward. My professional work still revolved around storytelling, so I shouldn't have been surprised when Anne, the director of the Women's Center, asked me to direct the performance of the Vagina Monologues. Turnabout is, after all, fair play, because the year before I had persuaded her to bring that outrageous play to a conservative town, and it had a sold out audience. So now she thought it was my turn. Anne, I'm a storyteller, I'm not a director. I, she wouldn't accept, accept my excuses. So I thought, what? Well, what am I going to do? I was determined that anybody who wanted to be a part of it could be regardless of their skill on stage. We went through a couple of read-throughs of the play and after the second one, I said to Anne, um, we have no talent here. But what we did have was time. So we didn't assign roles and work on the, work on the script. Instead, we sat in circles and the women shared their own stories. The room filled with red lines. But as they told their stories, the women gave each other courage. So when it came time to assign the actual roles, they knew which ones were right for them. They chose their solos, and those who didn't want to do a solo became a part of, part of choral performances, or they worked backstage. One of them wrote a wonderful poem for it, and actually, in spite of her fear of her own speaking red lion, she performed it. When the last word was spoken, the last song sung, the audience rose to its feet, cheering the bravery and honesty of the women on stage and the women in their lives. And only the women knew they had tamed their red lions. Now, a couple of years later, in the aftermath of a uh, difficult life transition, I picked up the phone and called the Stage Bridge Senior Theater in Oakland, California. They were looking for a storytelling director with experience in storytelling, education, and community development. I just happened to have all three. So when the theater director answered the phone, I said, I think you're looking for me. For the next 15 months, I taught seniors to tell stories and took them into grades five and four classes in Oakland. The schools were all considered underperforming. That was a term that meant they weren't doing well. So I led a pilot project to see if storytelling could improve reading scores by inspiring children to see a reason for literacy. And it worked because of people like Jim McWilliams. Jim had worked as a civil rights lawyer in the South. He'd been friends with Martin Luther King, Medgar Evans, and many other civil rights activists. He was charismatic. His words were mesmerizing. And in retirement, he was going into schools to inspire young black children to believe in themselves. He taught me a red lion lesson. He was a regular storyteller for a grade five class in a rough neighborhood. They hung on every one of his words except this day. He stopped in the middle of his story and said, what's wrong? We're dumb kids. What do you mean you're dumb kids? They showed him a newspaper clipping. Their school was going to be closed because it was underperforming. They'd always shipped to other schools in different neighborhoods. They knew no one in any of those neighborhoods and they knew they'd be mixed race neighborhoods and they were afraid. So Jim listened and said again, well, are you dumb kids? No then you have to act. He gave them a lesson in organizing that probably changed the trajectory of some of their lives. He had them write letters to the school board and demand an in-person hearing. He promised to go with them, but they would do the talking. They were excited. Maybe they weren't dumb kids. But he warned them, the board has made up their minds. They are going to close your school but you will show them that you are not underperforming kids. 
So they presented their case to the school board. They got press attention for doing so. The school was closed, but the kids were not shut down. They learned they were as bright and deserving of a good education as their peers in the rich neighborhoods. They would face red lines the rest of their lives, but Jim McWilliams gave them the tools to do so. Well, the darn red lines still stalk me. I think they do everyone. They, sometimes they befuddle the, me, but they don't stop me anymore. And storytelling in many ways keeps them at bay. And these days that mostly means writing and photography. In 2008, I retired from my position as food security project manager with Interior Health here in Kelowna, British Columbia. I worked with communities that wanted to change their stories around food and health. And the health authority sometimes called on me to teach organizational storytelling at a time when it was still a relatively new concept. Now, next chapter. I'm almost 75. I don't have time for red lions. They still pace on the periphery, but I have too many books to create to take them too seriously. So here's what my creative life looks like now. Plants, animals, and people fascinate me endlessly. I took a photography course and learned how to use some new publishing software, and I started publishing books with Blurb. Then I thought, check out Amazon. So I started with two books of hope-filled essays and a book about clouds. And then I went to Ingram, which has better distribution to libraries and schools, and I did a series of children's books based on the true story of a brave little hen named Millie. I collaborated with Kelowna poet Marilyn Raymond for some magical poems. And I, I used her poems and my images and published another book. Then another book about Kelowna and a journal of hope. And then I started looking at my photographs from, from my camera and thought, these tell stories. So I started writing them like this one. Uh, it started out as a contest to see which side of the creek could shine brighter. The more they stared at each other, the happier they felt. What began as competition became admiration. And this one, when I saw some cones, you know, the, the marker would be telling you to go one way or the other. What happened to you, shrimp? Tall boy looked down at the bedraggled cone. Skateboarders, sighed shrimp. The newbies are pretty hard on me, but I got my revenge. I tripped a few of them. Well, that led to publication of 10 small books of small scale stories. Now, some people create scrapbooks, but I put personal and family stories into books and, and give them as gifts. And photographing the natural world around me has become a passion. My Lightroom catalog has tens of thousands of entries. Now, I chanced upon a class in Photoshop artistry taught by Mr. Sebastian Michaels. That set me on another path. So I threw myself into the training and began to create digital art. The kind you saw in the Red Lion story and here. And on it goes into however long my future may be. As long as my energy lasts and my passion keeps burning, I'll keep creating. We are all called to be the truest versions of ourselves. Sometimes the red lines keep us from daring to walk proudly in the world. We don't have to let them. Turn around, face them. The surprising reality is that many of them turn out to be pussycats, though definitely not all of them. I just want to end with a tiny little story that um, I heard aeons ago from a, a marvelous storyteller, Laura Sims, who's still telling stories. She's in New York, and if you get a chance to hear her, by all means do. She tells a lot of stories about the, the Hoja Nasruddin, and the, their stories from Persia as well. And she said one day, uh, he was playing the, the Comanche, and it's a stringed instrument that you tuck between your knees and you play it up and down the string, and it sounded like this. And his wife was going crazy. 
she came into the room and she said, Nazardine, what are you doing? All the other men, when they play the Comanche, they play it up and down the string. And he said to them, they are all looking for this note. Thank you. <laughs> closing words this morning is a poem by Ellen Bass. The poem is, The Thing Is. To love life, to love it even when you have no stomach for it, and everything you've held dear crumbles like burnt paper in your hands. Your throat fills with the slit of it, when grief sits with you, it's tropical heat, thickening the air, heavy as water, more fit for gills than lungs. When grief weighs you down like your own flesh, only more of it, an obesity of grief. You think, how can a body withstand this? 
Then you hold life like a face between your palms, a plain face, no charming smile, no violet eyes. And you say, yes, I will take you. I will love you again. Our final hymn this morning is De Coloris, played again by Steve Bell. everyone for joining us this morning. Next week, we continue on the theme of momentum. When you're on a roll, you're on a roll. And when you're not, you're not. The switch from one state to the other can be sudden and confusing. How do we experience momentum in our lives as individuals and groups? How does that affect and how is it affected by us and the way we interact with others? How do we attempt to maintain positive momentum and interrupt negative momentum? And how do we prepare ourselves to deal with the switch between them? Westwood's friend, Robbie Biden, will be sharing his thoughts on this topic.